If you could do that for us, that would be very helpful. If you have your Bibles tonight, turn to the book of Philemon. Philemon, and we will read verses um, 17 through 20. It says, If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. Albeit I do not say to thee, how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the privilege of being here tonight. Thank you, Lord, for a place to meet. God, in Jesus' name, please bless. Let tonight be helpful. And uh, Lord, I pray it would be, um, Lord, I pray it would really help us in just all sorts of ways in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, uh, a couple Sunday nights ago, we were in Philemon and we were in these verses and um, we really spent a lot of time talking about that thought where Paul said, um, you know, I will repay uh, what Onesimus had um, wronged Philemon. He said, I will repay it. And we uh, we talked about that whole thing of the Lord uh, repaying um, all our losses. We talked about that. And uh, so with that thought in mind, um, you come to verse 20. And, um, and of course, Paul is still reasoning with Philemon. He's he's about to send Onesimus back. In fact, in fact, you know, uh, we read this and we um, when Philemon read it, I mean, Onesimus is standing right in front of him and he's got this letter in his hand. And um, it's, uh, he's, he's still trying to uh, pave the way for Onesimus to come back. And if Philemon wants to send him back to Paul, that's fine. But what Paul wants to see is he wants to see Philemon Welcome him because he's now a brother. He's now a believer. His whole world has changed, obviously changed. It has been pr a proven change. And now he wants Philemon to recognize that. And in verse 20, he says this. He says, yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. You know, one of the distinguishing marks of our life in Jesus Christ is joy. Um, it is not a distinguishing mark of other religions, uh, not even remotely. Um, years ago, I was in Toronto and uh, I was there just for an evening or for a day. And um, th the church that we were with, they were doing the same thing we, we do now. They were uh, renting a facility, only they were on a very tight time constraint. And so um, uh, as we were um, as we were exiting, Another group was coming in to use that same large room. And um, I can't remember if it was, um, it was one of the Eastern religions. I don't remember which one it was. And the preacher told me um, he had had some conversations with the leader of that group. And um, uh, he asked that, that guy, he said, uh, do you sing songs of praise to your God? Do you sing songs about how great your God is and what he's done for you and what a blessing it is? And the guy said, no, we don't have songs like that. Um, you know, uh, joy is one of the distinguishing marks of the Christian life. Um, now, I realize, I realize trouble comes. And, and you know, when I say joy, I, I, I know that you're not always going to um, be riding the top and you're, you're not always going to be 
you know, shouting hallelujah every day. Um, but it is one of the things that God gives. And it's one of the things that Satan wants to take away. It is the greatest advertisement for Christianity that there is. It is a joyful Christian. It is the greatest advertisement not only to the lost world, but to other believers. It's the greatest encouragement. When you find a believer that is joyful, you know, other believers see that and they realize they can have it and they want it. Now, I say that, but I, I, I say that with this thought, first of all, that it is one of the effects of salvation. You know, we know a lot of believers that, that and you know them too, they may not be joyful this evening. They may have a cloud of troubles. They may be backslidden. They may be whatever they are, and they're not joyful this evening. But every believer starts at the same place. Uh, they may not all express it exactly the same, but boy, the moment of salvation, the moment of that trust, the burden rolls away. Uh, there's relief. There's peace with God. And some people, some people are overjoyed and are just bouncing off the wall. Some people just smile. Some people weep tears of joy, but they all start at the same place. Look at Acts 8 for just a moment. Keep your place in Philemon. And look at Acts chapter 8. You can't show me anybody anywhere in the Bible, anywhere in the Gospels that met Jesus Christ that was not immediately on a brighter spot in their life and happy and relieved. You can't show me one. You know, if, if, if you're here this evening and you don't know the Lord, I, I can guarantee you one thing. I can guarantee it. And that is, I, I can't guarantee that your path will be rosy. I can't guarantee that it will be trouble free. But I can guarantee that the moment you enter into life in Jesus Christ, there'll be some joy there. Because the Spirit of God comes in and the fruit of this Spirit is love, joy, peace. Look at Acts 8. And of course, you guys know the story. This is the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, Philip witnesses to him. Acts 8, 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Now watch. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he, the eunuch, went on his way rejoicing. I mean, he doesn't know anything. All he knows is he's embraced Jesus Christ. And the birds are singing in his heart. And he's driving that chariot with the biggest smile you ever saw. And he doesn't even know what's going on. He's just rejoicing. That's what salvation does. You know, the, the disciples came to Jesus in Luke chapter 10 and they were all excited because they were casting out devils and uh, and the devils were just, they were, I mean, the Lord had given them supernatural power and in almost every case, they could command the devils to come out and they would leave and the disciples were just floored. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Um, you know, they had power to heal people. Um, can you imagine having the power to, uh, you know, you've got some relatives that are sick. You know, uh, you could go down to the children's hospital, just start walking down the halls and heal them. Can you imagine? Uh, that would make your heart sing for joy. You'd see those parents and they'd be weeping and they'd be hugging your neck and you'd go to the next room. And, and boy, you know, this thing of what Jesus did, it was always, it just created, you know, happiness and happy stories everywhere. And the disciples come back and they're just thrilled. And they're especially thrilled 
that they can cast out devils. And Jesus said, rejoice not that the devils are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. We talked about it this morning. You know, there is a day coming and we anticipate that day and all our troubles and all our sorrows will be gone forever. And, uh, and you know, we look forward to that day. And why is it that that day is ours? It is because our names are written in heaven. And you know, I don't care if, if you're in bankruptcy. I don't care if you're about to get a horrible report from the doctor. You know, it doesn't matter how your world is collapsing. But if you know Jesus Christ and your name is written in the book. The Lord said, rejoice. Amen. Rejoice, because it's all going to be over shortly. And you'll be in that wonderful place. Joy is one of the distinguishing marks. And you see it, you're there probably still in Acts chapter 8. Look at Acts chapter 8, verse 5. Acts chapter 8. Verse five, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake. In other words, suddenly everybody's responding. Can, can you imagine? Hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Verse seven, for unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them. And many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. The gospel comes to town and what comes with it? Not just joy. Great joy. Great joy. Now, I know you guys know this. But this joy that God gives us is more than just a positive outlook, okay? So, um, you know, jump with me, if you would, in the Old Testament. If you, if you go, if you see Matthew and you, you keep going left, you'll see a bunch of little books, and you'll, you'll see the book of Habakkuk. Go to Habakkuk chapter 3. I often hear from Brother Gip. Brother Gip and I are longtime friends. Um, Brother Gip is a little over 10 years older than I am. And, um, and I remember meeting him when I was 18. And, uh, man, I was in Bible school. And I remember he did our dorm room devotions one night. He was just passing through town. And he was good friends with the dorm uh, supervisor. So uh, the dorm supervisor said, Brother Sam, can you come and do the evening devotion with the guys? And I will never forget that night. You know, there's that odd service. There's that odd place that just makes a real impression on you. And of course, Brother Gip was about 30 years old then, and he was in his prime. And uh, man, he just did a simple devotion that night on talking to the Lord. And, um, and wow, it, it really made an impression on me. I've never forgotten it. I remember going to bed that night and thinking, because I, I heard Brother Gip pray that night. He gets all done talking and then he prays. And the way he talked to the Lord, it was just so normal. It was just so like he was really talking to somebody. You know, it wasn't all these formal spiritual phrases. And yet it wasn't disrespectful. It wasn't sacrilegious. And I remember going to bed that night and I got on my knees and I thought, I'm going to talk to God like that. And I just remember what a blessing it was. Well, we're way down the road now. Brother Gip is in his early 70s. And you know, in these last few years, he's just suffered horrible pain. And it's been worse than ever lately because, his, for, because of an accident from long ago. His, um, his neck vertebrae are deteriorating. It's pinching the spinal column. Uh, it, he just lives in agony. But I heard some recent messages that he preached. And uh, you'd never know it to hear him preach. And I, I hear from him often, and I'll get a text from him. And he'll say, hey, Brother Joe, you know, um, please pray, and he'll sort of give me an update with what's going on. And then he'll say, 
you know, he'll talk about his pain, which he, he doesn't do much, but he tells me, you know, what's going on. And, and, uh, and then he'll say, he'll say, but aside from my pain, he said, I am so happy in the Lord. You know, it, it's more than a positive outlook. This thing of the joy that the Lord gives. We're not talking about, you know, well, we're going to be positive, you know. And Some of you, you've got that book in your house. Um, uh, well, not that one, but that's another one. Oh, I can't think of the name of it now. Um, anyway, it's one of these little self-help books, you know, about how to be positive about everything. And, uh, and you know, there's there's some helpful thoughts in there. But um, but our joy is not that at all. Look at Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17. Habakkuk 3, verse 17. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vine, the labor of the olive shall fail. He's talking about judgment. He says, he says, although I'm going to live through a terrible time here. And the fields shall yield no meat. The flocks shall be cut off from the fold. And there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. You know, Christian joy, there's something that God puts in us. And I mean, I mean, it doesn't mean that you don't shed tears. It doesn't mean that there's dark days and dark weeks and dark months. It doesn't mean that. But in the midst of all that, there's something that's there that you can still rejoice and you're still thankful and you're still looking forward to what's coming and you're still thankful for what God's done. And you know when that when your black clouds lift, the next thing that happens, joy just springs because it was there all the time. You know, joy is the foretaste of our eternity. Look at Isaiah 51. What's it going to be like in heaven? Well, you know, we try to imagine it, and the Lord tells us some things. I think sometimes people think we're gonna we're just gonna do this. We're just gonna walk around like well hi, Brother Cook. <laughs> and just gonna have this goofy, goofy, goofy smile on his on our face. And and uh, you know, heaven's a happy place, but you're not gonna be a zombie. You're gonna be yourself. You're gonna be yourself minus sin, which that will be a wonderful feeling all in itself. You'll still know. You'll be, you know, somebody said, well, I know my loved ones in heaven. And John R. Rice said, will I be any dumber in heaven than I am now? No, no, your intellect will be perfect. Your memory will be perfect. You know, uh, the Bible says that, the, you know, that there'll come a point when the former things are wiped away and, and all that. But, but, you know, it, wh what is it going to be like in heaven? People are going to be rejoicing. And when I say rejoicing, um, rejoicing is an action. It's not just walking around going, boy, I'm happy to be here. No, rejoicing is, is people are, you ever seen anybody that's, you ever seen a little kid that's really happy and they're just, they're just full. That's what heaven's going to be. Everybody's going to, everybody's going to be young there. You know, you talk about being excited and praising the Lord and, Sometimes, and we don't have any of those in here tonight, but you'll, you'll find some, and I don't mean this critically at all, because God knows if we live long enough, we're all going to be there. But you know, you'll find somebody, and they're old, and they're just sitting in their chair, and they're going, well, I'm glad these young people still have some energy. Amen. In heaven, in heaven, in heaven, we'll all be young there. We'll all have the energy that we once had at our best and more. And you'll have one thing on your mind. You'll be so glad to be where you are and about the, you're going to be shouting and praising 
And the, the rich, the guy in the temple that got healed, the guy in the temple that got healed in Acts 3, the next thing you know, he's walking and leaping and praising God. There, there's going to be a lot of action on the other side. People be rejoicing. Look at Isaiah 51. Isaiah 51, verse 9. Awake, awake. Put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days and the generations of old. Art thou not it that hath cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? Art not, are thou not it? And when he says it, he's referring to the arm of the Lord. Okay. Are thou not it which hath dried the sea, the waters of the great deep? That hath made the depths of the sea a way for the ransom to pass over. Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. And everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. You know, uh, you know what our joy is? You know, there's times that you'll you'll feel it. There's there's times it'll be really there and times it really won't be there. Uh, you know, the Lord sort of if you walk with the Lord, he sort of controls the manifestation of all that. He 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 wants you to trust him. You know, you're, you're not always feeling everything. But, you know, that joy that you feel at times. It is the foretaste of eternity only there. It'll be off the chart, over the top, never ceasing, forever. You have to wonder about, you know, the people that, you know, the, the Oilers, you know, they they win a game and everybody goes crazy. And, and uh, and you know, I'm, I'm against that. I know we got some Oilers fans in here. But did you ever think of how shallow that is? And God bless your heart. I love you. I got people in my family get all excited about that. But did you ever think about how shallow that is? So they scored a few pucks and they beat the other team, you know, and, and of course you were right into it, you know, vicariously, you know, you're, you're watching it, you know, and they win and, and then you go home is, is that going to bless your life tomorrow? No. Is that going to help pay your bills? No. Is that going to make you more spiritual? Certainly not. It's just uh, it's just a bunch of noise and hoopla and adrenaline for a couple hours. That was meaningless. I'm not saying you can't go. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying in light of eternity, it was meaningless. You know, in heaven, you're going to rejoice. And it will have meaning. Past, present and future. Joy is one of those things that walks with Jesus Christ. Look at Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. You know, I, I can't speak for everybody. I know everybody's experience is a little different. Um, but, but I know something about joy. Oh, my soul. I've been so happy I thought I was going to bust. Man, I remember my first year being saved. And uh, I, had, I, had, I had labored religiously under fear and torment for years. And then when I got saved and I realized I had the real deal and it was eternal and I had peace. I had never had that. It would not go away. And I can remember one night after church, I uh, and I was single then, you know, and and I just uh, went. I walked two or three miles because I just I just couldn't handle I just couldn't handle standing still. I was so happy. I remember I remember times I'd be in my dorm room and I'd play some good Christian music and and it was stuff that exalted the Lord. And all of a sudden, it would just hit me. One old preacher called it the "Can't Help It." And I would go over and I would shut my dorm room window because I didn't want anybody to hear me or see me. My buddies were gone. 
And I would be jumping up and down, just thanking God, just rejoicing. Many days since then, well, I remember in Prince Albert, there were some nights there and there's been some here. I had one recently where I just went outside and I just felt like I had fireworks going off in my heart. And you can't, you can't explain that to somebody that's never tasted it. You wish that you could open your heart and show it to the, the lost person that dreads being a Christian. And you want to say, oh, if you knew this. That's what Jesus gives. It's not found anywhere else. And someday, it will be like that every day of the year forever. Luke 1, verse 39. Luke 1, verse 39. This is the season where we read these passages. Man, there's a lot in these passages. Luke 1, verse 39. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass... When Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. You know, Mary's walked in there with Jesus in her in her womb, and she comes in and greets greets her. And and you know, wherever Jesus goes, and you know, there's joy. And he comes into that room, and that babe in Elizabeth leaps. The babe leaps for joy. You don't have to turn there, but in Hebrews one, it says about our Lord that he is anointed with the oil of gladness above his fellows. Joy. It is one of the distinguishing marks of our life in Jesus Christ. And in, in Philemon chapter one there, Paul says to Philemon, he says, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. He said, refresh my bowels in the Lord. Refresh. Refresh means to, um, I, I looked it up, it means to bring new life. I mean, I don't have to tell you, you, you know what it is to be refreshed. And yet it, it means to invigorate. It's it's the same thought as to revive something. Only only in the, in the scriptures, you know, the Lord revives us. But refreshing often happens from believer to believer. And Paul says to Philemon, let me have joy of thee. Refresh my bowels. He said, Philemon, he said, you know, if you make the right decision here, if you do the right thing, he said, man, he said, you're going to bless my soul and you're going to bring new life to my drooping spirits. You're going to help me, Philemon. Refresh my bowels. And of course, the bowels is the inner man. It's the part that feels deeply. You know, you know, some people think that, you know, God's, God's people, God's men, God's great men. They think, you know, well, you know, they, they were just, they just had nerves of steel and they didn't feel much of anything. I, boy, that's just not true. That's just not true. You know, you can have a smile on your face, but you, you, you still feel. I mean, somebody can stab you to the heart and you can, you know, just, just cause you're not, laying on the floor weeping, it, it doesn't mean that you didn't feel anything. Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. He felt deeply. And no doubt Paul fought that battle that every true Christian fights. And that is the battle not to get hard and cynical and calloused. It's the battle not to get a dark perspective. And Paul fought that battle. 
Look at 2 Timothy. Second Timothy one. And Paul writes to Timothy, this is the last letter Paul ever wrote. And he writes this letter shortly before his death. And in second Timothy one, verse 15, Paul says to Timothy. This thou knowest, verse 15. That all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. You know, I don't I don't know all that had happened, I don't know all that transpired, I don't know all, you know, we don't know the reasons necessarily why. But you know, Paul was that great apostle that started those churches and and people loved him and he was instrumental in their salvation and instrumental in starting churches. And he'd go back around and visit them. And here he is at the end of his life. And he said, uh, he said, you know, he said, uh, they won't have anything to do with me now. Look at chapter four, second Timothy four. Verse 16. Paul's at the end of the road. He says in verse 16, at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Look at verse 10 of the same chapter. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world look at second corinthians chapter 12 second corinthians chapter 12 you know we hear about uh, uh jonathan edwards and you know he he was instrumental in what was called the great awakening in the new england states uh there in the in the u.s uh, a few hundred years ago and um, the sermon that really that they give credit to the outbreak of the spirit of God was called sinners in the hands of an angry God. Many of you have heard of that. And, uh, you know, you hear about that great revival and you hear what, about what God did. But, you know, you don't hear much about how Jonathan Edwards life ended. You know, in those early days of that movement, you know, it, that revival, it just spread like wildfire. And it was a great thing and uh, lasted for a while, covered a huge area. And um, Jonathan Edwards had many children. I don't know. I want to say 12 or 14 kids. I can't remember. And in that day, that was very common. And um, uh, later on in Jonathan Edwards' life, uh, the revival stopped and and uh, those same people that he had been so instrumental in helping, they turned on him. Uh, he was not welcome in his church anymore. And um, and he was totally outcast from them. He had not done anything. You know, he hadn't robbed them. He hadn't committed immorality. It just it's just uh, all they which are in Asia. They turned away from me. He winds up, you know, uh, shortly before his death, he took a seat at a, uh, the president of a, of a Bible college there in, that, in those states there somewhere. And, uh, and then um, uh, the, the plague broke out and, and he died. You know, he, he started off, you know, we, we, we know what he's famous for. But, boy, he, it sure didn't end well. Look at 2 Corinthians 12. Verse 14. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 14. Behold, the third time 
I am ready to come to you. And I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours. In other words, he says, I don't, I don't want something from you. I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And in verse 15, he says, and I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Paul said, it seems like the more I give, the worse it gets. Look at 2 Corinthians 6, 2 Corinthians 6. Paul fought that battle to not get hard and cynical and calloused. And he fought not to get a dark perspective. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 8. In this chapter, he's talking about things that he went through that proved him as a, as a minister of God. And in verse 8, it says, By honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers, the people were saying, you know, Paul was deceiving everybody, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, notice, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing. Somehow, Paul had learned, and you know, it was Paul that wrote, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Um, Paul worked that even though he was sorrowful, I mean, he wasn't happy those folks had turned their backs on him. He wasn't happy when Demas walked away. It broke his heart. It brought him sorrow. And yet, it didn't kill his rejoicing. It didn't kill his joy. He says to Philemon, Philemon, let me have joy of you. It's like Paul saying, Philemon, I've had an awful lot of sorrow lately. He said, please let me have joy of you. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Let me find that your answer to my letter invigorates me and brings me back to life and encourages me to go another day. You know, some people, and, and you understand this, some people, and I'm talking about as, in the Lord, refresh my bowels in the Lord. Some people are draining. And some are refreshing. Some people... They always keep you guessing. And that's not a good thing. But some people, they give you assurance. Some people are always riding the fence. But some people cross the line and they clearly go for Jesus Christ. Some people, you just can never quite rest. You know, you're just, you're just not really sure, is this going to work? And how long is this going to last? And, and boy, I've been praying for this, but I'm afraid to get excited. And, and some people, you can never quite rest, but some people you're confident in. Some people, their countenance and their atmosphere and their love for Christ and the truth are invigorating. And they bring new life and energy to your heart because you go, wow, God's still doing something. God's still working. This thing still works. And you know it does in your heart. But you're glad when you can see it in somebody. Look at 1 Corinthians 16. First Corinthians 16, verse 17. And Paul says, I am glad for the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus 
For that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied. For they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore, they that acknowledge ye them that are such. Paul says to Philemon, Philemon, let me have joy of you. Paul had poured his life into a lot of people and and some of them, you know, some of some some of them, he, he never knew how it turned out. Some people did well and some people didn't do well. You know, in third John, John writes and and um, and he says to that elect lady, he said, I have no greater joy than to know that my children walk in truth. You young people in here, you know, it ought to be one of the goals of your life, you know, and, and, and I, again, I, I don't, I don't mean that they, you know, especially when you're an adult and you're married, I, I don't mean that they run your life. I'm, I'm not saying that, but you know, it ought to be one of the goals of your life to uh, be a blessing to your parents. It ought to be one of the goals of your life. If you've got Christian parents that love the Lord and you're here in this room tonight, it's a mighty good chance, you you know, most of you, 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 it ought to be one of the goals of your life to bring your parents joy, to put a smile on their face, to make them glad, to make them rejoice in the Lord because their prayers are being answered. It says, the father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice. And Solomon said, the father of a fool hath no joy. And Paul says to Philemon, Philemon, you're, you're about to make a decision here with this letter you're reading. And he said, Philemon, would you please make my heart sing? Would you please make it so that when I get the news, I'll fall on my face and say, thank you, God. And I'll feel relief. You know, um, blessed is the believer who brings joy to other believers. And, 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 and of course, it, that's just a given that, that you'll bring joy to the lost too and, the, and that they'll be drawn to Christ. But blessed is the believer who is a joy to other believers. You know, in 1 Thessalonians 2, Paul said, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing. He said, what is our joy? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? You know, our joy is in the Lord. and um, But boy, a lot of our joy, it, it does ride on Christians, other believers. You know, you get good news, you you know, you see a prayer answered. You see somebody making progress. You see somebody getting rescued. You see somebody turn around in the right direction. Uh, you see somebody uh, getting one of their prayers answered. I remember years ago being in a meeting, and and uh, it was a meeting where, you know, God was really moving. And in the song service, just, just like at our meeting not long ago, you could tell people were getting blessed, and there was real joy happening. And the, the old preacher was back in the back along the wall, and he said to the guy next to him, he said, you know, I love all this stuff. And he said, I, I'm blessed by the singing. But he said, but it blesses my heart to see the people rejoicing. Amen. And, you know, as we've looked at this letter, we keep going back to this thing that, of course, Paul is a picture of Jesus Christ in this letter. And Jesus Christ, you know what he says to you and me? You know what he would say to you and me? He would say, let me have joy of thee. Brother Gip often, um, often will talk about this in his messages. There's a, a line that he comes out with every once in a while. And he'll say, he'll say, you know, um, wouldn't it be wonderful to put a smile on God's face? And, you know, he's not this stern taskmaster. The devil always wants you to think that. He's gracious Amen. and he's kind and he's yeah. patient. And God knows he's going to take us to heaven in spite of all our failures and our ups and downs. And, and um, but, 
And, and we're going to enter into his joy. You know, he's going he's to say at some point, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And man, we'll step through that threshold and again, we'll rejoice forever. But you know, if, if the Lord could say something to you and me tonight, I don't know where you're at in your spiritual life. And we're, we're, all, in, we're all on a journey. We're, we're all somebody, we're all in process. And, and you know, we're, none of us are where we want to be. But tonight, tonight, if the Lord came and put his arm around you tonight, I don't know exactly what he'd say, but one of the things he'd say is, Robert, Brother Cook, let me have joy of thee. You know what the Lord's joy is? I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And the Lord's looking down and he wants to bless your soul. And he's hoping that you'll care about his joy and you'll want to give him joy. Let's pray. Help us, Lord. Lord, perhaps it doesn't cross our mind a whole lot. We're, we're so concerned, Lord, about the things we have to deal with and, and even our own joy. And uh, Lord, we're thankful that you care about our joy. And we're thankful, Lord, that that's one of the things you delight to give. But Lord, would you help us that somehow in our thinking, we would begin to think about giving you joy. And Lord, surely that can't be hard. Help us, Lord, that we would bring you joy in Jesus' name. The piano is going to play. And as it plays, if God has spoken to your heart tonight, why don't you talk to him? Boy, wouldn't it be good as the Lord reviews your life one day and you look over and you catch him smiling?
Lord, thank you that you're the good God. Thank you, Lord, that you're the God, Lord, who gives joy to his people and God who has planned an eternity of joy off the chart. God, thank you, Lord. God bless, make this more and more a reality to us, Lord. God, may we treasure, Lord, the joy that you give. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, before you go, um, we, uh, we've we got the cooks here with us, and and, and they uh, they are not able often to be with us, and, uh, and uh, most of that is because of the stairs that are building. So brother and sister cook are always glad when we have church here at the hotel because they don't have to climb the stairs. And brother cook uh, told me he's been working on a song and asked if he could sing it for us tonight. So, so he's going to sing for us. Refresh us. <laughs> Oh, thank you. <laughs> I need that. Well, I appreciate the message about joy. And uh, December, for me, is one of the joyous months. Because in, back in 1994, uh, I got to lead my dad to the Lord. Just before he passed away. My mother was saved the year I was born. She prayed for me for 29 years. She prayed for my dad for 46 years. So I want that to be an encouragement to you never to give up in prayer for your loved ones, for those that are lost. We, we do not know the hour of the day that the Lord will really get a hold of their heart. Just notice that this, uh, I didn't print this <laughs> for uh, this being down here. This doesn't raise up, eh? We can put some salt on the here. That'll work fine. This old eyes. Thank you so much. Oh, great. <laughs> I can see it. <laughs> okay. I heard this song over 35 years ago. I said to my wife today, I don't think I've ever sang it in public, at least not to a crowd like this. And uh, I'm not a professional by any stretch of the imagination, but it's the message here that I want you to hear, not my singing or my guitar playing, okay? It's called This Little Child. Who would have thought that so long ago and so very far away a little child would be born in a manger day? Who would have thought this little child who was born the King of Kings the son of just a carpenter, but for whom the angels sing. And who would have thought that as he grew and with other children played, this child with whom they laughed and sang die for them someday and who would have thought this little child could make a blind man see feed the hungry make rich the poor and set the prisoner free Oh, who would have thought this little child was who the prophet said would take away the sins of man and rise up from the dead. And I And I will always sing 
this little child is a king and I believe and I will always see this little child Many years have come and gone, yet this world remains the same. Empires have been built and far, only time has made a change. Nation against nation, brother against brother. Men so filled with hatred, still killing one another. And over half the world is starving, while our banner of decency is torn. Debating over disarmament, while killing children before they're born. And fools who march to win the right to justify their sin. Oh, every nation that has fallen has fallen from within. Yet in the midst of this darkness, there is a hope, a light that burns. This little child, the king of kings, someday he will return. And I believe I will always see this little child. Is the king? Yes, I believe, and I will always sing this little child. Is the king of kings? Who would have thought this little child is who the prophet said will return to judge the world, the living and the dead? Oh, can't you see that long ago, so very far away? That Jesus Christ, our only hope, was born the King of Kings that day.